It was a quiet day in the U.S. stock market with the S&P 500 down about 0.16% today. Perhaps everybody's just waiting for the fireworks to start tomorrow, as we will hear Jerome Powell in a speech, and then we'll also see some employment numbers by the end of this week as well. So maybe we're just gearing up for more volatility later this week. But for today, things were relatively calm. It was one of those strange days where the S&P 500 was actually down. However, more stocks were up in the S&P 500 than finished lower, and that's because Apple had such an influence on the markets here today, finishing quite a bit lower there. Uh, we're going to take a look at what that means for our posture. We're going to get into some sector analysis, some macro analysis. Then we're going to get into our trade application example where I wanted to feature a discretionary stock that has a country name in it. It's not the United States, and congrats to the soccer team for the big win here today. But it'll be a separate country uh, that's involved in the travel and leisure space. Uh, so I'll leave it at that as a bullish swing trading setup. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's November 29th, 2022. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below into the description area. Make sure you're signed up for our email distribution list. We're also heavy users of Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me at Brandon Van Zee. And we really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these Market Outlook related posts. And then last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join us at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and dive into today's trade activity. And per usual, I've got the uh, S&P 500 heat map pulled up here in front of us to kind of give us a, a lay of the land here for the day. And as you can see, it's been kind of a, uh, a, a split day. Uh, it really didn't seem like it was an aggressive bullish day or a, an aggressive bearish day. Pretty quiet day. Uh, remember that uh, Jerome Powell does speak tomorrow. And so uh, perhaps markets will get a little bit more uh, volatile uh, after hearing his speech. Uh, it won't be an official interest rate decision, but nonetheless, sometimes uh, when he's speaking at various conferences and stuff, he'll, he'll give his... Uh, he'll tip his hat towards what he's thinking right now in terms of future interest rate policy. So all eyes will be on Jerome Powell uh, here tomorrow. And of course, remember, uh, this represents the first week of December, or at least it will be by the end of the week, which is what's important for this uh, conversation, because it's the first Friday of the month when the uh, employment numbers are released. And so uh, that has the potential to kind of jolt markets one direction or another here uh, on Friday. So perhaps today was just everybody waiting calmly, uh, you know, on pins and needle needles, perhaps uh, just waiting to see uh, some of these uh, more important economic reports and, and from the Fed themselves here this week. So today, pretty quiet day, all things considered. As I look for uh, different uh, patterns or consistencies uh, here within the heat map. Uh, one thing that catches my eye is that I do see that financials appear to have a pretty good day. Notice that JP Morgan was up 1.6%. Uh, remember the S&P 500 was down 0.17% today. So not an aggressive day, but uh, market was down. So the fact that you know JP Morgan, one of the biggest bellwethers within the financial space, was up 1.6% was notable. You'll also notice that uh, good old Berkshire Hathaway was up 0.59%. Uh, some of you might have seen my tweet about Warren Buffett here uh, earlier today and that graph that will show you how much money you need to make back uh, based upon the corresponding losses that take place and tied that back to his famous quote of rule number one, don't lose money. In fact, in one of the replies there, uh, I think it was to, to James Boyd, one of my old colleagues, uh, I also posted a uh, video of Buffett uh, having that speech back in 1985, if you're, you're curious about that. But anyway, uh, Buffett's mothership here with Berkshire Hathaway was up nicely today. And of course, those are the two biggest players within the financial space these days. So it's good to see both of those higher, but uh, really they weren't alone. Pretty much all the big banks uh, were higher today. Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, PNC, Truist, Citigroup, all of them doing pretty well. Here's U.S. Bank up about 2%. We actually just bought that stock uh, one week ago uh, from today uh, in my dividend growth investing class. So good to see that one having a little bit of juice here uh, finally as well. Some other consistent patterns, I would say that industrials looked pretty strong today. 
Speaking of dividend growth investing, we actually concentrated on the industrial sector here in my class today. So I uh, would like to thank all of you who joined us over the Black Friday sale uh, over the weekend. So if you are one of our newer subscribers, great to have you on board. Uh, I do have that recording from the dividend growth investing class posted already from my class earlier today. So if you were not able to join me live, you're welcome to check out the recording and see which stock uh, got added to the class portfolio there. Uh, but it looks like a lot of green there. Uh, within the industrial space. Notice that UPS was up 2.77%, uh, perhaps some strong Cyber Monday numbers leading to uh, more activity with those brown trucks driving around your neighborhood. Uh, we also see that uh, Union Pacific, uh, one of the big railroads here in the United States was up 2%. Of course, there's a possible railroad strike, so uh, a lot going on there, but the other railroad players did pretty well today as well. Uh, we had Norfolk Southern up nearly 2%. Uh, we had CSX up 1.48%. And then remember, the fourth big uh, railroad in the United States is actually owned by Berkshire Hathaway uh, with Burlington Northern. And so that was kind of embedded within that financial holding company there. We also see that Boeing had a strong day, up over 2%, and Caterpillar up one2 to 1% as another one of those dividend aristocrats that's kind of leading the way to the upside here uh, more recently. Some of you might have seen my post last week where I mentioned that um, not only have we seen stocks like Caterpillar and uh, Chevron and McDonald's and Aflac and Pepsi and all these other great dividend aristocrats hitting new highs, but last week we also saw um, air products and chemicals, uh, and also automatic data processing. Uh, they have very similar uh, ticker symbols, APD and ADP, uh, but both of them hitting new 52-week highs last week, joining their other aristocrat brethren uh, up there at those heightened levels. Notice down below here, it looks like we do have some pretty consistent green in the energy patch today. That's one that I've been keeping a little bit more of an eye on here lately because things have felt a little bit wobbly with, with energy. I think I might have mentioned that either in this presentation a week ago or perhaps it was in one of my classes along the way. But I've uh, been noticing that energy has been um, not necessarily as consistently strong as it was uh, earlier in the year. In fact, I'm pretty sure I did mention in this presentation a week ago how I was mentioning that um, what, something's got to give because what we had been noticing is that the, the oil prices on that 12 grid that we'll talk about a little bit later had been falling, but oil stocks themselves had actually continued to be strong. And I said, something's got to give. Either oil stocks have to go down to oil or oil has to go up to oil stocks. And right now it's kind of feeling more like it's oil stocks that kind of need to give up the ghost and uh, start giving some of their gains back a little bit. Of course, that can change, but you know, uh, just seeing some of these days here back and forth lately where there's been some pretty aggressive sell-offs. Today was a snapback, uh, and so who knows, maybe it can gather itself and, and kind of push forward from here. But uh, there has been a little bit more volatility uh, within that energy sector lately, so keep your eyes on that. Um, another area that uh, catches my eye in terms of consistent green would be down here in the right hand corner. This is your real estate sector. And it looks like nearly all of the real estate areas were up today. Notice that utilities were largely down right up here above it. Normally those two, oftentimes I should say, uh, do trade together. So when one of them is up, both of them are up, or one of them's down, both of them are down. Remember both of those two areas, REITs and utilities, are probably considered the most interest rate sensitive. So they get pushed around by interest rates a bit more. But today was one of those oddball days where you did not see that uh, benefit or that correlation, I should say. Uh, if I were to right click on real estate here, uh, we can investigate a little bit further. And yes, that is the case. Every single uh, REIT in the S&P 500 today did close in the green. And I have been hearing a little bit more chatter about real estate recently. Uh, we'll talk about interest rates a little bit later when we get to our 12 grids. But we have had a little bit of slip uh, in the, uh, the, 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 the treasury yields out there. And so if treasury yields are, are falling, even if it's ever so gently, uh, perhaps mortgage rates are falling as well. Remember, we were talking about mortgage rates, uh, rates that were up above 7%. And of course, that slows um, house buying activity uh, to a grinding halt in many cases because uh, we, at least here in the United States, are just simply not used to 7% mortgages. Now, those of you that are uh, of the generation older than mine, I'm, I'm in my mid-40s, 
Uh, but for those of you that were adults in uh, the late 70s and early 80s, you have gone through that before where uh, mortgage rates were in double digit percentages and, and you live to tell the story. So congratulations. Uh, but for a lot of the younger generation, uh, we've never seen anything like that. And it's a little bit uh, tough pill to swallow in terms of trying to determine what a monthly mortgage payment would be based upon the ultra high mortgage rates plus uh, having ultra high real estate prices themselves. And so for a lot of younger people, especially those just graduating college, perhaps in their 20s, um, they're having a harder time uh, finding an actual uh, house that they can afford uh, for those reasons I just cited. So uh, today, uh, it seems like we've been hearing a little bit more from the home builders and some of those other correlated plays to the housing market that have seen to be a little bit more optimistic than they had, let's say, a month or two ago. And maybe, just maybe, real estate as a, as a sector here is benefiting from that sentiment as well, where maybe the hope is that interest rates aren't, aren't going to spike into oblivion to the upside, and maybe they'll kind of start stalling out and people can make more rational decisions with their money once again. So anyway, a good day there uh, for the REITs. And you know this is an area that had been quite out of favor earlier this year. In fact, I was mentioning my dividend growth investing class earlier today that the REITs actually are our biggest sector component of the current dividend growth investing portfolio that we're putting together. And remember, as dividend growth investors, we're comfortable with the idea of buying stocks after they've gone down because it also means that when prices are down, yields are up. So we get incentivized to buy securities when their prices fall. I know not all of you traders will agree with that, but long-term dividend growth investors will. And so uh, from that perspective, we're hoping to see a little bit of a snapback in the REITs uh, for at least the, the, the purposes of the current DGI portfolio that we're managing here at Market Scholars. So we'll see where it takes us, but today a nice green day there uh, for the REITs. All right, let's go ahead and pop back on over here to the S&P 500. Um, let's also talk about uh, discretionary. I've been making this point quite a bit for those of you that follow me on Twitter, and I think I also mentioned this in the Market Outlook video last week alongside my classes as well. But look at this area in the upper right-hand corner. This is consumer discretionary sector. And if you're just squinting and you're not um, you know, looking at the fine detail and you're just kind of looking at the haze of this kind of square up here, you're probably saying to yourself, yeah, it looks pretty red. But you're falling victim to the same thing that most people are falling victim to right now and have been for the last several weeks. I've been trying to make a point of it because I don't hear a lot of people talking about this. But consumer discretionary uh, is actually a very strong sector right now if you were to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. The problem is most people, when they want to get a just a quick and easy judgment call on consumer discretionary, look at XLY, which is an ETF that tracks the market cap weighted consumer discretionary, whereas you can see Amazon is the most influential, Tesla is the second most influential, and then Home Depot is the third most influential. And pretty much all these other dozens of consumer discretionary stocks have very little impact, if any, whatsoever. Really, it's those three big dogs that control pretty much all of XLY. But if you were to look through these ticker symbols case by case, because this is what I do for my Monday morning top-down trend trading class, I'm here to tell you there are a lot of strong charts in the consumer discretionary space right now. It's just that nobody is uh, recognizing that because everybody is so fixated on Amazon and Tesla and how it is kind of keeping XLY down. Meanwhile, there are dozens of consumer discretionary stocks that are in really strong trends right now. You will notice in kind of the tippy top right hand corner here, we have more of the, uh, the, the, the travel and leisure type types of companies that are up there. Booking Holdings, that's the company behind Priceline, Marriott, Hilton, Las Vegas Sands. Um, <laughs> Uh, I actually had to uh, book some hotel rooms at the Venetian in Vegas, and uh, I about fell out of my chair at what the prices were. Um, I am almost embarrassed to admit what they are, so if you're curious, go and look at the Venetian's website uh, in the middle of March for the opening weekend of March Madness, and it is outrageous. Uh, I do it pretty much every year because it's, a, it's an annual trip that I do, and uh, and so I'm not somebody who's just seen it out of the blue, but um, 
this year, just to put it into perspective, is more than double the, the average per uh, room rate than it was just last year. I'm not saying like 10 years ago or something like that. I'm saying last year we put, paid a certain price, this year we paid more than double that, and it was almost triple had we included one extra day. Um, so it's absolutely bananas right now how strong the travel industry is. It's as though it has no idea that there are people hurting in this economy right now, and it's just guns a-blazing in travel right now. Las Vegas Sands, by the way, is mostly a Macau story right now. I've actually been to that property as well uh, more than a decade ago, so I'm, th I'm sure things have changed since then. But Las Vegas Sands, despite the Las Vegas in its name, uh, is mostly a China story these days. They've actually sold many of their Venetian properties to a real estate investment trust known as Vici, uh, although Las Vegas Sands does have other American properties for casinos elsewhere. But anyway, um, there, was, there was some news coming out of China here today that assisted both Las Vegas Sands and MGM. And also, where's Wynn? Wynn is in here somewhere, I'm sure, as well. In fact, let me just right-click on Consumer Discretionary so we can see it a little bit better. Uh, where is Wynn? There it is. Uh, Win was up 2.67% uh, today. MGM was up 2.69% and Las Vegas Sands up 2.31%. All three of those companies have uh, the very coveted uh, gambling licenses over in Macau, uh, uh, there's less than 10 of them issued. And so the American operators actually have three of them. So uh, that's been treating them quite well. But of course, with China-US relations um, kind of getting cold in recent years, uh, it's been more challenging for their stocks. So today was a rare, uh, you know, strong day uh, from that perspective right there. So anyway, keep your eye on consumer discretionary. I know Amazon, Tesla, Home Depot get all the press. But there are some really strong retailers, really strong travel stocks that are out there right now as well. In terms of um, consistency on the, on, the, on the red or the negative side of the equation, I would probably throw technology into that conversation. You can see Apple was down yet again on some of their, um, their supply woes with their iPhone and whatnot. It was down 2%. Of course, they're having challenges over in China right now as well with some of those protests taking place. So Apple uh, struggling today. And of course, Apple is the most important company, not only in the technology sector, but in, in the entire S&P 500 because it has the largest market cap. So that put a little bit of a lid on things here today uh, for the S&P 500. Uh, Microsoft was also down about a half a percent here today. Uh, also uh, would point out that after the bell tonight, CrowdStrike is getting absolutely annihilated here this afternoon. Some of you will recall that I did a bearish trade on CrowdStrike here a few weeks back. It was actually quite a successful trade uh, because it was one in which uh, I bought puts on it, which is a leveraged bet, and we tripled our money in three days. And I decided, you know what? Markets usually don't give me that opportunity, so I'm gonna take my money and run uh, before they report earnings. Well, of course, in hindsight, uh, I wish I'd have hung on to those puts because they'd be worth even more today because CrowdStrike uh, was trading at $138 at today's close, and it's currently trading the after hour session at 112. It is getting smoked right now. So a lot of those software as a service types of stocks could be down tomorrow as a result of that. Uh, I do still have that data dog uh, long put spread going so that might uh, work to our advantage there uh, with that particular uh, company. Of course, we still have a bearish trade on Airbnb, so maybe that will get an assist there to a degree as well. But um, anyway, um, interesting activity there after hours. Uh, I should also mention healthcare is in the news after hours, including Johnson & Johnson, including Amgen, and then also a foreign company, Sanofi. Uh, those three major pharmaceutical companies uh, are said to be in talks to attempt to buy Horizon Pharmaceuticals. I just tweeted about that a moment ago, so some of you might have caught that. Uh, it didn't go on to say which of those three companies was the most likely suitor, just that all three of them had approached that company, and Horizon's uh, share price was up like $25 per share after hours. That's HZ. NP, I believe, is the ticker symbol on that one. But uh, anyway, as I mentioned on Twitter, remember Johnson & Johnson 
and Amgen are very close to all-time highs right now. It's as, the, as if they don't know uh, that the market is struggling in 2022. Of course, Johnson & Johnson being a dividend king and Amgen being a dividend achiever, uh, they're both companies that we have owned at various times throughout my dividend classes uh, throughout history, and uh, they've been some nice, strong stalwarts within our portfolios there over time. But like I mentioned on Twitter, because their market caps are still massive and they have not you know, seen a 20, 30, 40% meltdown like so many other stocks this year, that means that all else being equal on a relative basis, they have more heft and more money to throw around. If they want to go out and buy smaller players in the healthcare world, um, they have very bloated market caps in order to kind of uh, have that more expensive currency. If they don't want to pay cash for the deal, they can do a stock for stock deal. And uh, that's something that a lot of other companies just don't have the luxury of right now because many other companies are down considerably, right? Some of the like the, the Palantirs and the Pelotons and, you know, all those really exciting, innovative companies that, you know, Kathy Wood was so excited about a year ago. A lot of those are down like, you know, 90% or something like that. So those types of companies are unlikely to be able to go out and make acquisitions on their own. It's the big, bulky giants, the uh, big blue chip, dividend paying types of companies that are ones that are more likely than not to be able to facilitate transactions moving forward. You'll also notice that consumer staples seem to struggle a little bit here today alongside the utilities. Um, so not a whole lot of love for some of those defensive areas here today. All right, let's go ahead and now uh, pop on over to the other part of the platform and get a better sense of some of the breadth numbers now tonight. And um, this was one of those oddball days where the S&P 500 itself was down. And yet when I pull up the S&P 500 and break it down stock for stock, you actually saw 55% of the stocks in the S&P 500 close in the green. And that's just a friendly reminder of the same concept I was mentioning to you a moment ago when we were talking about XLY and the consumer discretionary stocks. The S&P 500 is market cap driven. So on a day like today, when Apple and Microsoft and Amazon and Tesla were all down, that's gonna have a greater impact on the pricing of the S&P 500 than you know Las Vegas Sands and, and, and Wynn and Booking Holdings and those much smaller companies to the upside. So today was a rare day where we had 55% of the companies in the S&P 500 close in the green, yet the S&P 500 itself closed in the red. So today was a, a pretty strong breadth day, at least on a relative basis. Uh, and really where uh, that is being masked is by the mega cap players that are out there. All right, let's go ahead and now take a look here at our four grid, get a sense of how today's activity may have affected uh, our postures using that market forecast technical indicator. Remember, for those of you that are our new uh, clients that signed up over our uh, Black Friday sale over the weekend, uh, you have access to all 50 plus of the charts that David and I um, use for our presentations. And so uh, you may want to take some time perhaps in this upcoming weekend going through the tutorial that I put together uh, for you on our tools area of our website in the premium resources area and then downloading all of those shared links into your Thinkorswim platform if you think that would be helpful to follow along with David and I. But it does require a bit of effort out of you. It's not something that happens quickly. So maybe carve out an hour or two uh, this upcoming weekend and get things all squared away there. Uh, but anyway, this is chart 4 B. And as you can see, the S&P 500 was down just a touch today, 0.16% to be exact. It was actually the third day in a row to the downside for the S&P 500. Haven't had a whole lot of you know, three-day losing streaks recently just because markets have been fairly resilient. Uh, we did have another one over here. It actually ended up being a four-day losing streak here in the first week of uh, November. But otherwise, it's been pretty strong trading for the S&P 500. Naturally, it's not as strong as what we see on the Dow, as we've been mentioning for the last several weeks. The Dow is actually at new multi-month highs, or at least it was late last week, whereas the S&P 500 is still trading below where its high was back in the in the uh, fall uh, on, on September 
uh, 12th. And of course, if these charts went back further, we'd see even greater heights. Uh, this is only a three month view that we're looking at here. Remember for the NASDAQ itself, we have now passed the one year anniversary of its all time high. Uh, and for the S&P 500, that will happen the first week of January. So keep those uh, moments in, in the back of your mind as well as we progress through these more bearish conditions that most people have felt this year. Of course, dividend growth investors hanging in there quite a bit better than most others, as I alluded to uh, last week when showing you what was going on with NOBL and some of the aristocrats out there being down uh, just barely uh, this year when the NASDAQ still down like 30%. So uh, there's certainly more areas of the market this year where if you had picked and choose where you wanted to hang out, it would have a greater difference to your results. Some years, uh, markets kind of just travel together in one direction or another, but I would not categorize 2022 as one of those types of markets. This market has found haves and have-nots. Now, admittedly, there's a lot more have-nots, uh, but we have lots of stocks that are still hitting 52-week highs and all-time highs here more recently. So it's not like it's just been a complete onslaught of selling. Perhaps that comes next year, right? Uh, we have to always consider that possibility. But for right now, there have been more resilient areas of the market to hang out, and it's usually the big blue chips that have been able to fulfill that role for us, which is why the Dow Jones chart looks the best out of these four that we see in front of us. So the S&P 500 was down 0.16% today. The Dow was actually up a touch today, 0.01%. So remember, the S&P 500 is going to have a much bigger impact by those mega caps like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla. The Dow does not. Now, some of those stocks are in the Dow, but the Dow is a price weighted index where something like United Healthcare or Goldman Sachs is more influential than something like Apple or Microsoft. And a stock like Tesla is not even in the Dow. So it's just uh, calculated differently. Uh, and in this case today, it made a difference. Dow closed in the green while the S&P 500 closed in the red. Down below here, you did see that the NASDAQ was down about 0.59%. So once again, it's the NASDAQ that is the laggard. There's a reason that most of my bearish trades that I've shown you guys in the last month or two have been those types of tech-oriented NASDAQ-focused stocks. It is the area that continues to to be the underachiever of this batch that we have. And as I mentioned, could very well be the case tomorrow as well with CrowdStrike getting crushed after hours. And I think um, Network Appliances is getting crushed after hours as well in other tech stocks. So uh, tomorrow morning, what we know right now, we should assume that the NASDAQ will probably be stumbling out of the gate on a relative basis compared to some of these blue chip other areas of the market. Um, we do see that the Russell 2000 managed to close higher today as well. It was up 0.31%. So the Russell actually left at us today. Uh, Dow managed to close in the green as well, whereas the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, which have bigger allocations towards Apple, were the ones that did uh, close in the red here today. In terms of our um, postures, you'll notice the S&P 500 and the Dow continue to have strongly bullish postures for the moment. However, on the downside here on the bottom two charts, the NASDAQ now has that pink background color as does the Russell 2000. But of those two, as I mentioned a moment ago, I do view the NASDAQ as being um, uh, less interesting or perhaps more interesting if you want to be bearish. Uh, just look at the um, the green line at 73 versus 77 here on the Russell 2000 and it's telling you that the Nasdaq's just lagging a little bit there. They're both above their rising moving averages so you know credit where credit is due but of the two I would venture to guess that the Nasdaq would be the one that has the, the best chance to break that moving average to the downside if we do get a little bit of bearishness whether it's with Jerome Powell's speech tomorrow or with the you know employment numbers on Friday or whatever the catalyst is, it seems like the NASDAQ would be the most likely uh, to get uh, down below that moving average. Also, I should point out real quick that some of these charts may have, oh, not quite. No, I was, I was just going to say some of these charts may have bullish intermediate confirmation signals. And I'm sure yesterday David uh, shared that with you because uh, he's got a good eye and he would have caught that yesterday. And it was very close here today to have a follow-up day of bullish intermediate confirmation signals, but we didn't quite get there. Just a reminder, in order to get that signal, we need the green line to be considered bullish, which 
that is the case with the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, but in addition to that, we need the red line in the lower reversal zone. And look at how close it was. Um, the S&P 500's red momentum line was at 20.73. Uh, if it would be at 19.73, it would be uh, a second straight uh, bullish intermediate confirmation signal. But uh, today it just bounced barely out of that lower reversal zone there. And the Dow bounced a little bit more aggressively out of it because again, the Dow was up today. Um, so we just barely missed it. And, and the same thing on the downside. With the NASDAQ, we actually have the red line in the lower reversal zone, but we don't have that bullish posture on the green line anymore because it fell out of the upper reversal zone. So kind of interesting to see. We were very close to bullish intermediate confirmation signals in multiple cases, but for various reasons, we didn't quite get there from an official perspective. All right, let's go ahead and stop on over here to the internet real quick. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support these free videos that you watch on YouTube. Uh, many of you uh, might be surprised to learn that it takes at least three hours of David and I's time to do these videos uh, because, of course, we're not just doing the you know hour that we're recording. We're, of course, doing the editing, the uploading, uh, the writing of the, the paragraph that you see on our website up above, uh, the sending out of the notifications on uh, you know, things like social media, uh, sending out the emails, all that stuff takes time, right? It's not automated. We're, we're, we're the only two people that work here. So we do our own work. Uh, so the point being, if you guys appreciate the effort that goes into creating this free video for you as often as possible, we ask one simple request out of you. Click like for us there on Twitter. As long as we're up and over 100 likes on Twitter, I'm happy to do a full length video for you, including additional 12 grid analysis and a trade application example. Uh, if we're below 100, likes, then I start questioning whether it's worth my effort uh, to put in three hours of my busy schedule. Uh, especially right now, I've been, yesterday I think was my busiest day I've ever had at Market Scholars for the reasons I mentioned to my students earlier today. Lots of emails, lots of uh, updates on our websites, and uh, taught two classes yesterday, and uh, it was just a crazy, crazy day yesterday. So, uh, you know, uh, there, there, there would definitely be good reasons for me to say to myself, I don't know if I can commit the three hours to doing a free video. So anyway, if you want us to continue to do these videos for free and you get value and enjoyment out of them, uh, take the five seconds out of your day and click like for us there on Twitter. Since you guys did that uh, successfully for me the last time around, over 100 of you clicked like, just barely, 101 of you, uh, but I do appreciate all 101 of you. Thank you so much for your support of this project uh, along the way. Please continue to do that if you want these full length videos. Um, also, while we're over here on the, the internet, um, let's also remind you, for those of you that are uh, premium members, you'll notice that some of our more popular links are popping up on the right hand side here, including the Thinkorswim chart links setup tutorial along with uh, the Trading Rooms registration. You can also find those resources up here under the Tools Premium Resources area. If you're looking for that, you probably got a welcome email from us that would have said the same thing, but that's where you would find that information right there. And then I mentioned earlier today that um, we uh, that I posted my dividend growth investing class. If you click on the trading rooms tab up here the, on the main menu, it will then take you to our calendar and uh, the posting is right down here. And uh, for those of you that were curious, the way that we build out this calendar is we build it out month by month. So since this happens to be the end of this month of November, um, our, our Cal calendar for December is not built yet. David will be doing that here uh, either tomorrow or the next day. And then once he's done building out the uh, December class, uh, calendar, he will send an email to all of you who are premium members so that way you can re uh, register for all of those classes at once. Uh, our monthly plus members have to go in and register for the classes one by one, so it's a little bit more inconvenient that way for them. But for those of you that took advantage of our Black Friday uh, three year premium package here over the weekend, you get that opportunity to uh, basically register for all of the month's classes in one fell swoop. So just wanted to explain that because I know that can be maybe a little bit confusing using once you get up and running. Uh, just so happens that uh, we've got a couple more days left in November here of classes and then we'll build out our whole calendar uh, for the month of December and rinse and repeat as the months go on. And we'll look forward to having many of you with us for uh, the next three years. In fact, a lot of our uh, prior members
members uh, renewed some of their subscriptions and their uh, subscriptions are going all the way out to 2027. So we're, we're really locking down the next five years for, for many of you here. And David and I will be happy to serve all of you uh, in our premium experience there. Uh, anyway, let's talk about our sector selector here now. This gets put together on Friday evenings, and so it is a couple of days stale by now, but still gives us a pretty good sense as to any rotations that might be taking place. If you are a premium member, you'd find this area by hovering your mouse over tools, clicking on sector selector. You will notice here that we had one major change, and it should not come as a surprise, at least if you were listening to me one week ago because I said right here in this very video last Tuesday uh, that uh, there was a good chance that energy would be falling in the rankings uh, once we approached the weekend, unless there was a huge rally out of energy um, you know, with the rest of the week. And we really didn't see that. We saw maybe a little bit of a rally, but not a, not a huge one. And so no surprise here, you do see energy falling off the top ranks for the first time in a couple of months and is now listed here in the fifth position. So it's not even in the top four anymore. So since they fall, they fell off the top, they were then replaced by four others that moved up one notch each. Industrials, which has been hot for quite some time, is now the new king up at the top. Remember, that's your Caterpillars, your Boeings, all those companies I had mentioned just a moment ago uh, in the heat are in the uh, yeah the, the heat map uh, that were doing so well. Many of them are making multi-month highs. I mean, stocks like John Deere, as an example, might come to mind there. So uh, keep your eye open for strength in the industrials, and that has been a known situation. Remember, industrials have been in the top four since the beginning of October. That was even before the market bottomed. Uh, and so uh, they were listed at, in the number two position back on the first week of October. And they've been in the top four rankings this entire time. Uh, but this week is the first time they have supplanted uh, energy up there at the top. Consumer discretionary moves up to number two. And again, uh, this is an equal weighted uh, ranking system that I'm using here. So that's why I'm trying to make such a big point that the, the market cap weighted consumer discretionary is clouding the fact that there are a lot of strong individual consumer discretionary stocks that are out there. In fact, the trade that I did for you guys in this very video one week ago, some of you will recall it because I was joking that, uh, you know, I was, I was asking the, the question jokingly, uh, do you want to own your own sports team? Of course, uh, we all want to be like the Walton family owning the, uh, the Denver Broncos, although maybe not this year. Uh, Russell really hasn't come through, has he? Uh, but uh, I think you get the, the gist. Usually sports teams, professional sports teams, are owned by the ultra wealthy in a private uh, transaction. But some of you will recall that one week ago, uh, my trade application example that I, I delivered to you on a silver platter uh, was the uh, Madison Square Garden Sports, uh, ticker symbol MSGS. Uh, and um, I am happy to report that that bullish uh, trade, swing trade that I did on Tuesday was successfully closed out on Friday uh, at max gain. That trade went straight up for me, exactly the way you want it to. Remember with swing trades, you're expecting to be in them for three weeks, not three days. And this was actually not even fair to call it three days because one of those days was Thanksgiving when the market wasn't even open. So really it was just two days we went from buying Madison Square Garden uh, at what I viewed as a, an acceptable price to hitting max gain. So that's another example of that strength in the travel and leisure that I was talking about earlier on the heat map with stocks like Booking Holdings and Marriott and you know Hilton and Las Vegas Sands and all that. Um, sports teams play right into that same hand there. So there are a lot of consumer discretionary stocks that are very strong right now. It's just that most people are not seeing it because of what's happening to Amazon, Tesla, and Home Depot. Uh, you'll also see here financials moved up one slot from number four to number three. And again, today was a strong day for the financials of JP Morgan and Berkshire Hathaway and US Bank and some of those. Uh, and then healthcare snuck into the top four here week over week as well. And as I mentioned before, healthcare was in the news here uh, in the after hours session with a potential splashy deal on the horizon for Horizon Pharmaceutical shareholders. On the downside of the, uh, of the graphic, you'll see that we mostly held the same levels. 
utilities, real estate, communication services, they're still stuck at the bottom. A lot of interest rate sensitivity in that group. So if you're looking for value out there and higher dividend yields, those are the groups that you're looking for. If you're a trader looking for price relative strength, then look at the top of this graphic for those opportunities. All right, uh, let's go ahead and pop back on over to the main part of the platform and let's do some 12 grid analysis. All right, so uh, let's get started here with chart 5A. This is our asset class 12 grid. And as this gets pulled up, a reminder that the background colors will be either green or pink. The pink ones will be bearish postures according to the market forecast technical indicator. And the green backgrounds will be bullish postures according to the market forecast technical indicator. So as has been the case so often this year, let's start with the bottom two corners because that's really what's been driving activity in 2022. And as you can see down below here, we did have treasury yields tick up just a hair. Uh, we are still well below a 4% 10-year treasury yield. And that has been a, a little bit of a, a sigh of relief for a lot of groups. I mentioned real estate specifically here a little bit earlier where maybe uh, there will be a little bit more home building activity uh, if the 10-year treasury yield is under 4% as opposed to above it. Now, who knows how long that lasts? We haven't really heard from Jerome Powell specifically, and maybe we will tomorrow, uh, that he plans on you know, pulling back his rate hikes, right? We've heard speculation from others that that's might what, maybe what he wants to do, but we haven't actually heard it from him. So tomorrow may be an important day from that perspective, but what we do know right now is that treasury yields have fallen out of bed at least uh, long duration uh, from that perspective. The short-term treasury yields are actually quite attractive. Uh, we've been talking a lot about that in my classes. In fact, I myself have been buying a number of three-month uh, treasury bills myself, uh, and that's very odd for me. I am not a bond guy. I'm a dividend stock guy. So when, when, the, when the treasury yields become attractive enough to capture my attention, that's really saying something. But right now, um, the three-month treasury yield is well in excess of 4% at the same time that the 10-year treasury yield is quite a bit under 4%. So naturally, you're probably attracted to the short-term rates right now as opposed to the longer-term rates, and that might kind of get resolved as time moves on, but that's known as an inverted yield curve right now. And uh, there are some very attractive opportunities there uh, on the short end of the curve. So we'll see if that affects things tomorrow, but right now we are still uh, deeply inverted uh, on most of those yield curve measures. So we had a, a rare up day uh, for yields today. It's the second in a row, but remember prior to that, we had a three-day sell-off that produced this oversold cluster signal. So this might be part of that reversion to the mean type of a bounce in yields right here. Perhaps it gets up to this falling 30-day moving average and then rolls over yet again. We're kind of in the same boat with uh, the US dollar. Remember that the US dollar broke down um, earlier than the treasury yields. They broke down maybe a week or two earlier than yields themselves did, but both of them are kind of following one another, and, and they have been for most of 2022. And when both of them are out of favor, that's generally a good thing for markets at large. And that's part of the reason why the stock market has been supported during this last month and a half is because the US dollar and treasury yields have finally broken down. Uh, I don't know if they're down for the count. In fact, my, my suspicion is that they're not. I wish that was the case and maybe I'm just being paranoid, but I kind of get the sense that we're still going to see uh, them rise from the dead again, which means that we'll probably have more chaotic and more bearish trading in the stock world. But who knows? I could be wrong about that. And if I am, I'll be happy about it with my long-term assets continuing to move higher. But you will notice that there is uh, an obvious inverse correlation with the S&P 500 going up at the time when the US dollar is going down. And um, here today, it was just the exact opposite, right? The, the US dollar was up fractionally here today, and the S&P 500 was down fractionally here today. Um, so keep your eye on that relationship, but similar conversation there, as I just mentioned with the treasury yield, we do have an oversold cluster signal here on the US dollar from two days ago. We've now rallied two days in a row since then. This could be part of that reversion to the mean type of a move here as well, where right now the expectation is that it will remain more bearish, but um, because these are macro effects, they're not driven by corporate profits as much as they are driven by 
Fed speeches and geopolitical skirmishes and things like that, you have to acknowledge that the organic trading from a technical analysis perspective can be thrown out the window a little bit more easily with something like the US dollar and the 10-year treasury yield as well. So um, we'll keep you posted if things change in a major way, but right now they both remain with those bearish postures. Let's talk about the two commodities squished in the middle on the bottom rung there. They look quite a bit different from one another these days as well. And it's kind of the opposite of how they looked from one another earlier this year. Earlier this year, it was crude oil that was doing very well and gold was sputtering to the downside. They've had a reversal of roles here in the last month or so. I think for gold's case, it's because the US dollar has been weak. That has allowed gold to get strong because gold is priced in US dollars. Whereas oil is driven a little bit more by what's going on with things like Russia, Ukraine, and perhaps things like um, the economy. Remember, oil is a more economically sensitive commodity than gold is. And so if market participants feel like the economy is sputtering or about to sputter, then there's probably less usage of fossil fuels to kind of fuel that economy, right? And so uh, perhaps a, a little bit of reading the tea leaves there from the oil markets, but that was actually up 2% today. However, you remain below that falling moving average with a bearish posture. Uh, gold was up today as well, but finished well off of its highs. Notice that long upper shadow there on today's candle, um, but it remains with a bullish intermediate posture and remains above its rising 30-day moving average. In terms of the bonds in the middle rung there, all three of those bond categories remain bullish postures and remain with price above rising moving averages. So it's another way of saying interest rates have been falling for the most part in the last, let's call it, month and a half. And that has given bond prices themselves an ability to rise. And uh, today we did see a little bit of separation uh, because we did see TLT, which has kind of been the laggard of these three bond categories up until now. Uh, but again, today it did underperform. Uh, and you know that is um, something that's uh, kind of interesting uh, there as well. But it, it, it ties into what's going on with the interest rates. Obviously, with the 10-year Treasury yield up here today, then Treasury bonds themselves uh, are more likely than not to be to the downside. Uh, remember, these long-term U.S. Treasuries focus on the 20 to 30-year Treasuries, so it's not a perfect inverse correlation to the 10-year Treasury yield, but they, they do act fairly similarly uh, in that conversation. And so it's a good way to kind of think about things. When the TNX is down, you should expect TLT to be up. When the TLT is uh, or when the TNX is up, you should expect TLT to be down, and that's what we saw here today. Uh, foreign bonds and high yield bonds did not necessarily follow suit. Keep in mind what I've mentioned to you guys countless times over the last couple of years. There's a little bit more of a correlation with high yield bonds with crude oil prices. It's not a, a primary driver, but it does make an impact. And I think that could explain some of the benefit it received today. Because again, the market was down today. You would assume that today would have been considered a little bit more of a risk off day. Although from a breadth perspective, more stocks were up than down. Uh, nonetheless, those that were down were the big exciting tech stocks. So you kind of perceive today to be a little bit more risk off. Typically, when that's the case, high yield bonds do worse than these other bond categories. But today, they did a little bit better. And I think the reason behind that is because oil prices did quite well today. And a lot of the companies issuing junk bonds in recent years were in the oil patch because a couple of years ago, they were really struggling. Fast forward to where we're at today, they're much healthier. Nonetheless, uh, there is still that, that, that correlation that can take place there. So I think that's probably the reason behind um, a little bit of um, buoyancy there out of the out of the uh, high yield bonds and then foreign bonds uh, they've been outpacing US um, bonds here more recently as well and while today it doesn't really um, play into that theme of a weak dollar you can see that since the dollar topped out down here foreign bonds have outpaced US bonds and I think it is that currency conversation uh, that is the main driver of that relationship of foreign bonds doing better than US bonds. Let's talk about Bitcoin here briefly. Don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it's not something that a whole lot of people will trade since a lot of Bitcoin uh, is traded outside of brokerages accounts and 
places like FTX. Uh, good luck getting that money back. Hopefully, most of you that are trading Bitcoin are doing it through more reputable exchanges, or perhaps uh, um, you have a Bitcoin under your, I think they call it a, a cold wallet or a hard wallet, something like that. Uh, but point being, uh, somebody else doesn't have the keys to your Bitcoin, you do. Um, there's risks with that, of course, as well. But the point is, um, Bitcoin is not an area that we can trade all that easily uh, here in these thinkorswim platforms the way that we can with common stocks. We don't talk about it a whole lot. However, we do acknowledge its importance uh, as it is kind of considered more of an alternative asset class. And it's also a way for us to judge risk appetite. Uh, when Bitcoin is doing well, it generally suggests that rip risk appetite is strong and liquidity is flowing and the Fed is dovish. Uh, and when Bitcoin is weak, it's oftentimes the opposite of that. And that's kind of where we find ourselves right now. If anything has been surprising about this is that the Bitcoin has not held up with tech stocks here over the last month and a half. And I think it's just a, a matter of bad luck from a timing perspective with that whole FTX blow up. I think it kind of uh, tarnished the reputation of cryptocurrencies across the landscape, including the big kahuna of Bitcoin. I think if FTX did not happen, Bitcoin probably would have done a, a bit better in the last month and a half alongside those tech stocks. So a little bit of bad luck there, I think, for Bitcoin. But uh, it is what it is. You can see Bitcoin continues to trade at around $16,000 right now and does continue to have a strongly bearish posture. On the top rung here, uh, EFA uh, was up today while the S&P 500 was down. EFA was up 0.29% and their counterparts in the emerging world, EEM, was up 2.15%. China actually had a very good day. It wasn't just Las Vegas Sands that's been doing well, right? That's technically a U.S. company, but they're operational interests are in China alongside Win, And again, this is an example of some of these charts in consumer discretionary that are just crushing it to the upside. Um, so it wasn't just the casino news in China today. There were other tech stocks in China that were doing quite well today as well. One way to gauge that is through KWeb. It's an ETF that tracks internet companies in China. And notice that the KWeb was up 5.86% today. So a huge day for some of those Chinese companies like Alibaba and the like. And so uh, with EEM, including China as one of its key countries, in fact, probably the most important emerging market, then any day where you get outsized performance performance out of stocks like Alibaba, you're going to find that EEM has a good chance to outperform. And that's exactly what happened here today. But notice that between EFA, which tracks Europe, Australia, Japan, and EEM, which tracks the emerging markets, EFA actually looks stronger from an intermediate term perspective. In fact, I saw a tweet earlier today that said that EFA is currently at its, um, its six-month relative strength high versus the U.S. market. So quietly, Europe is coming to life here. And again, a big driver behind that is that huge drop in the U.S. dollar. When the dollar drops, foreign assets rise, all else being equal. Nonetheless, it is happening. And so uh, that's another thing that you don't hear a lot of people talking about out there, but you might want to put it on your notepad to say, hey, let's investigate some foreign stocks out there because they seem to be uh, actually outperforming U.S. stocks for once. Remember, in the last decade or so, U.S. stocks have trounced foreign stocks for the most part. So this is kind of a rarity to see foreign stocks outperforming at this moment in time. All right, let's go ahead and now pop on over here to our Sector 12 grid. This is chart 5C for those of you that are following along at home. And here we can see we only have one pink chart and wouldn't you know, how about that? It's energy. It's a little bit of a different conversation, right? For most of this year, energy, if they were the oddball or the redheaded stepchild or however you wanna describe that, it's the opposite way where they were the only green chart and all the rest were, were pink. Uh, right now it's the opposite. Uh, we have energy as the only pink chart. All the rest of the charts have that green background color telling us that we have bullish market forecast postures for those charts. But with energy, things have started to stumble just a little bit. Remember with these 12 grid charts, if you're newer to them and you're one of our Black Friday members and you're just kind of getting up to speed with some of the charts, you can right click on the 12 grid 
and then go to maximize sell and then you can see it a lot better and when you do that it'll actually pull up the market forecast technical te technical indicator down below when you're in the 12 grid grid view uh, there's just too much going on where the the system does not display the technical indicator down below but when you maximize it you can then go and see that and now we can see why we've got this pink background color notice that the green line on the market forecast has fallen out of the upper reversal zone uh, not by much, it's only at 78, but it is falling and it has crossed through that 80 uh, of the upper reversal zone there. So this one I wouldn't um, make too much of yet. Uh, it could be a sign of things to come. As I mentioned before, I have grown a little bit more worried about energy in the last week or two because it's felt more wobbly. Notice that this has not been the consistent one-way train like we saw back here in October where it was like going up pretty much every day. Notice that we're getting a lot more of these red candles, aggressive ones, kind of mixed in uh, to the grouping. This was kind of an interesting candle for XLE. Uh, and, and remember, this is the market cap weighted version of it. So this is going to be driven more by Exxon and Chevron than a lot of other energy companies. But nonetheless, this was at least um, somewhat promising to see this long lower shadow kind of, you know, with almost a hammer type of a feel to it at a support level there. And it did bounce off of that. But here we are a week later and we're already testing those levels once again. The good news is this 30 day moving average seems to be acting as um, support right now. And you are getting a bounce up and off of that rise moving average with today's move of 1.5% higher for, for energy. Um, so I think that it's too early to call it down and out. Um, there's a decent chance it just needs to flush some of the enthusiasm out of the sector. And if it can kind of prove to us that it wants to bounce up and off of this moving average, there's a pretty decent chance that that green line will be right back into the upper reversal zone before we know it. So this is still a pretty strong chart. It's just that the light pink background color is giving us a heads up that there's been a little bit more wear and tear within the energy patch here recently. As we look at the other charts, as I mentioned before, they're all green, uh, telling us that we have strongly bullish postures for those from an intermediate perspective. In terms of who the day's biggest winner was, to my eye, it looks like it's probably going to be utility. I'm sorry, uh, not utilities, real estate. Uh, that was the one I had mentioned before when we were looking at the 12 or the, uh, the, the, the heat map, the S&P 500 heat map, and every single REIT in the S&P 500 was up today. So when you have such consistency with zero down movers, then it's easier for that whole sector to be viewed as the leader of the day. And it was up 1.67% here today. Uh, the worst performing sector appears to be technology up here. Now again, this is XLK, which is the market cap weighted version of technology, which means that it's gonna be influenced more by Apple and Microsoft than all of the other tech stocks. And so that's part of the reason there. Remember, Apple was down over 2% today, so it's kind of pushing technology lower. Tomorrow, we'll see how CrowdStrike affects kind of the more up and coming software as a service companies. Uh, but for the time being, despite the three-day sell-off after the overbought cluster signal right there with that red dot, um, we do remain with the bullish posture uh, and it's still slightly above that rising moving average right there uh, as well. All right, let's go ahead and get into our trade application example now. And for that, I'm just gonna pull up chart 3A and I'm gonna stick with that theme that I had mentioned to you earlier a couple times in this presentation, which is travel stocks are hot. I'm gonna pull up ticker symbol NCLH. This is Norwegian Cruise Line Holdings. For those of you that enjoy your cruises, you'll certainly recognize this company. I've been maybe on, I don't know, three or four cruises in my life, and I don't think I've ever been on Norwegian, so I can't really say from a uh, personal perspective how they do, but I'm sure they do fine. But the point being, there were a lot of those cruise ships uh, companies that were up today because uh, Carnival came out and said that their uh, their their Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales uh, went much better than expected. Again, Americans are willing to travel right now. Uh, they most people uh, may not have any idea that the economy is 
uh, stalling out and could even get bad next year. Uh, they're living for today and they're going on cruises. And uh, Norwegian is a company that, as you can see, has been outperforming the S&P 500 with this dotted line down below and the price candles up above over the last three months. It's up about 23%. And you can see we've had a recent pullback to that rising moving average right there. And it's stabilized kind of by going sideways for much of the days in the last week and a half and the only day where it closed lower than the moving average was yesterday. So it was good to see that snapback rally here today. It was a pretty uh, aggressive day. Remember, this is a very low price stock. Unlike Madison Square Garden that I showed you guys last week, which was over $100, this one's only $16. So that makes it feel a little bit sketchier, I must admit. Sometimes I get a little paranoid with these smaller price stocks because I kind of get the sense that market makers take advantage of the retail investors a little bit more with these lower price securities. Nonetheless, the trade setup is here, so I figured let's go ahead and, and run with it. Um, this one, as you can see, now has not only a hold signal or a close above the high of the low day, which was yesterday, it also has this blue background color telling us that we now have a near-term bullish posture. And not only that, but it appears to also have what's known as a, a, a bullish near-term divergence. So notice down here on the 18th, uh, we had um, the, uh, the, the blue line at its lowest level here more recently. Uh, it was at 21 that day. And then we had a follow-up low right here yesterday on the 28th where the reading was you know, up there closer to like 35. So we had a higher move on the underlying indicator and the two candles associated with those two levels were this candle right here and this candle right here. So price went down at a time when we saw improvement on the underlying indicator and that's happening coincidentally at a perceived support area of that rising 30 day moving average. So I just did a simple bullish swing trade similar to what I did with Madison Square Garden Sports last week. So I just bought 100 shares of the stock uh, and I did a one for one reward risk relationship where I put my stop loss below the lows of the candles over the last week. And then that meant that our price target was up here closer to about 1740 or thereabouts. If you need those exact numbers, remember I provide those details to our premium members in our Telegram channel, which is a key advantage that our premium members have is not only do they get to learn what prices we got filled at, but they also learn how we're managing those trades. I got asked earlier today, you know, if I'm still in the data dog long put spread. And I said, yes, I am. And when I get out, I will uh, let you know there in the Telegram channel. So that's a, a huge advantage for our premium members, uh, especially if you're really busy during the day and you can't stop by our classes or what have you. Make sure you're taking advantage of all those resources. Okay, so that's what I had for you here today. Uh, bullish swing trade on Norwegian Cruise Line. Take advantage of some of that discretionary spending that seems to be benefiting the travel stocks right now. If you got benefit out of tonight's video, I ask one simple request. Please click like for me there on Twitter. As long as we're up and over 100 likes by the time I'm scheduled to do this video again on Thursday, I'll gladly give you another full-length video including a trade application example like this. On the other hand, if you prefer the shorter videos and you only want me to do a 15-minute video of only the indices themselves with no 12-grid analysis and no trade application example, then don't don't click like. And if we're under 100 likes, then I'll just plan on doing a quick and easy video that day. So I'll let you guys decide collectively. But whatever you decide, I want to say thank you for joining me here this evening, checking out this video, and I'll look forward to joining forces with you down the road. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.